Welcome to the first half of chapter two. Because chapter two contains enough new ideas that kind of lay out the foundation for what we'll be working with all semester, and it also contains a lot of um, ideas that would have been taught at the high school level, we've decided to split off the introductory ideas and graphical analysis to put it together um, with units in the first week so that we can then focus all of our efforts on the harder numerical problem solving that is introduced in chapter two in the second week that is fully devoted to chapter two content. So through this series of lecture videos, we will hopefully help you understand all of the new terms that we're gonna be working with, as well as thinking about how we can approach looking at graphs and gaining more information than just reading points off of the graph. In the first half of chapter two, there are not separate example videos like we saw with some of the chapter one problems and like we will definitely see throughout all of the rest of the weeks this semester because we're focused more on the concepts for this portion of the chapter than on the deeper, more complicated problem solving. We're saving that for, um, for next week. All right, so let's get started. Now chapter two is called kinematics, and so it's worth making sure we understand what that term means. It's from a Greek term meaning motion, and what it comes down to is that kinematics is the study of motion without considering its causes. So we can be talking about a car speeding up or slowing down without having to think about the physics behind what is causing it to speed up or slow down, the engine. In chapter two, we will be studying all one-dimensional kinematics. In chapter three, we'll be building on that understanding by studying two-dimensional kinematics. We'll see what complications show up when we have things moving in an arc instead of in a straight line. And in chapter four, that's when we'll actually learn about why all of these objects are moving the way that we see them move. Okay. So again, this set of lecture videos here is really intended to focus on the key ideas. We will be using these ideas for the entire semester. And so these lecture videos are extremely important for making sure we understand them. So first of all, the idea of position is a way to describe where an object is at a single moment in time. If you look around your room, uh, maybe the desk that you're at, you might have a water bottle that is sitting in a particular spot. My microphone is sitting in a particular spot. And so they all have positions. Let's com consider the number line at the bottom of the slide. I've listed number values, negative four through positive four, there's no units here, and we should be thinking to ourselves from chapter one, always have units, but for now, we'll leave them off. Maybe they are um, inches for a little coin that we have on our table. So position can have positive or negative sign. We have to choose where our zero point is, and in a lot of the actual situational problem solving that we do, our zero point will just be where we start moving when the problem begins but it's possible for there to be um, motion in the negative direction, depending on how we define things. So displacement is a change in position. It's one of the first big physics ideas that we need to make sure we understand the nuances of, because the direction of that change matters quite a bit. So instead of just being described in words, we can also describe this using our very first equation in this class. Delta x is how we define displacement because delta always means a change in and x is our one dimensional side to side uh, way of describing position. If we think about the x axis, that kind of thing. And very specifically, displacement is the final position minus the initial position. So let's say that we have a coin on our desk and it starts at the location that we marked as two. 
If we shift it to end final uh, location at negative three along our number line, then what is our displacement? So think about that for a moment. Okay, using our equation, we would put negative three in for the x final, minus positive two for the um, x initial, and we would get a displacement of negative five in our units, maybe inches. That negative indicates that it moved in the negative direction. So a displacement of negative five units is different than a displacement of positive five units. And so that tells us that already we are starting to think about something that doesn't really show up in everyday situations, not nearly as much. If somebody asks um, if you've gone for a walk recently or a run, you tend not to clarify what direction you were going and where you started and where you ended. You just tell them, tell them the amount that you ran or walked, right? If you have a Fitbit or any kind of um, fitness tracker, it will just count the number of steps, not caring where you go, whether you're going north, east, left, right, forward, backwards. And so distance is actually a separate idea in physics. When we have a trip where there's changes in directions, it is really important for us to understand that distance and displacement will not actually match each other if we turn around and come back to where we started. So in this example, again, where we start at two and end at negative three, the displacement is negative five units and the distance is just five units, not, not caring if it's negative or positive. All right, so we've got a picture from our book where our friend's house is at a position of zero. Maybe this is how this particular street does its addresses. Your house is 2.1 miles away, so it's at a position of 2.1 miles. And the grocery store from your house is an additional 4.3 miles, which means its address on this road would be x equals 6.4 miles. So I want you to think about this very first question. Let's say that you walked to your friend's house and back. I want you to think about how far you walked, the distance, like if you were wearing a step tracker, what would the total distance be? And what is your displacement based on our new physics understanding of displacement? So pause the video and actually write down your answers in your notes. The more often you pause the video and try these problems beforehand, the better practice it will really be and build skills and identify sticking points. Okay, so the first one hopefully wasn't too hard for us. It's not even a physics class question. You walk 2.1 mile, 2 .1 miles in one direction, 2. miles back. Your distance walked would be 4.2 miles. That's a lot of walking in one day. And your displacement, we look at the equation that we have. Our final position is our house at positive 2.1, and our initial position is our house at positive 2.1. So the change in x is 2.1 minus 2.1, and we end up with zero. And so we recognize right away that displacement in physics is not necessarily going to be telling us the thing that we intuitively understand from our everyday experiences. Now the difference between these two ideas, the reason why displacement sounds more complicated and distance is pretty straightforward for us to understand, can be better understood when we recognize that there's two different types of quantities that are gonna show up all semester. And it's probably one of the most important ideas in this whole course is to recognize that the behavior of these two different kinds of quantities is distinct. Scalars, although we may not have ever heard that word before this class, tend to be descrip describing the general numbers and ideas that we use every day. They're quantities that only have a size. How much money do I have in my pocket? How many um, cans of beans are in my uh, pantry? What is the temperature outside? Those are all scalar quantities. There's nothing having to do with direction whatsoever. Vectors are going to be the thing that we see all throughout 
this course. Vectors are quantities that have to be specified by both a size, the amount, and a direction, like a physical direction, compass, north, east, southwest. Um, in one dimension, we can talk about up and down, side to side, forward and backwards. Those are all directions that vectors are looking for in order to be fully specified. Okay. So some more examples of scalar quantities beyond the ones that I um, just came up with off the top of my head. Distance, we've already said, um, is one that doesn't care about where you, um, where you walk. So if you said in a sentence, she ran four miles yesterday afternoon, that's not telling us if she ran north, if she ran on a track, and we don't care when we're talking about distance. Temperature, for example, is just a number value, um, and that temperature can be positive or negative, and we need to recognize that that is still not telling us about the direction. Height, age, things that we think of on a daily basis, these are scalar quantities. And let's think about the speed. If we are driving on a highway and we glance down at the speedometer, that number value, is that a scalar quantity or a vector quantity? So first of all, if I'm telling you that I'm driving 50 miles per hour, the first question we always wanna think about are what are the standard units that we need that to be in for this course? We mentioned it in chapter one and the more that we practice with it, the more it will become kind of muscle memory to recognize. Miles is not our standard international unit for length, meters is, and hours is not our standard international unit for time, seconds is. So for part A, if we were to use that number in quantitative problem solving, we would need to turn it into meters per second, the same process that we were practicing in chapter one. And then this part B, how can I use that scalar quantity to then build a vector quantity? What can I add to that piece of information that now creates a vector quantity? If you told your screen uh, direction, then you're absolutely correct. I'm driving somewhere, right? Maybe I'm driving north on 131. And so when I say that I am driving 50 miles per hour north, I have now identified a vector quantity that actually isn't even speed anymore, it's velocity. Now really conveniently for us, speed starts with an S and scalar starts with an S, so it's easy to remember. Velocity starts with a V and vector starts with a V, so it's easier to remember. And there's a pretty fun uh, They Might Be Giants song um, that if you listen to it a couple of times, then it'll play in your head whenever we ask about speed and velocity. Okay. So the last thing for this very first video, um, in this chapter, our directions are always going to be left or right, forward or backwards, up or down. It's one dimensional motion. One of those directions will have a minus sign and the other will have a positive sign and by our standard conventions, almost always we will be seeing pictures and thinking about um, situations where to the right is the positive direction and up is the positive direction and forward is the positive direction. So I want you to read through this question and um, write down your answers to it. So pause the video to give yourself enough time to read through it yourself and to write down your answers. Okay, so it may have helped if you drew out a number line, you didn't have to, but if you feel like you're struggling with this idea of paying attention to the distance, that can help. All right, so if the student walks five meters to the right and three meters to the left, he has ended up two meters to the right of where he started. So his displacement is positive two meters or two meters to the right. We really do need to specify and state in our answer that direction idea. 
And then the total distance that he walked probably didn't trouble you at all. Five plus three is eight. He walked a total of eight meters. No plus or minus sign. It's just eight meters total scalar value. So we can see even in this very simple little um, example, all of the possible ways that displacement and distance won't match each other. We can't always just add a direction to get from one to the other. All right, so another set for you. And again, if you have not been pausing the video so far um, and you've just been listening to the answers, I need you to recognize that it is not nearly as beneficial. You are not gonna get as much out of this, which is kind of foundational ideas to build on unless you do pause and try on your own. Especially if you're watching this for a second time because these ideas are a little bit rusty Pause the video and see if you're feeling more confident now this second time around. Okay, so let's figure out the distance and the displacement for three different trips. Imagine that they are all happening on completely separate days, so we're not trying to add them all together. All right. You're pausing the video. Okay. So, in A, we go from our house to our friend's house. Our distance is 2.1 miles. That hopefully was uh, easy enough. And our displacement is negative 2.1 miles. Our final of zero minus our initial of 2.1 ends up with a negative number. We need that to describe the direction. Part B. We go from our friend's house to the grocery store and then back to our house. We have gone a total distance of 10.7 miles. 2.1 plus 4.3 plus another 4.3 is 10.7 miles. And that is the um, distance. For the displacement, thinking back to that displacement equation that maybe you wrote down in your notes, the displacement doesn't care about what happened in between the end point and the beginning point. It only cares about those two. The fact that we ended at our house, 2.1, minus we started at our friend's house, 0, ends up with a positive 2.1 miles as our answer. And then for C, we go from our house to the grocery store, then back to our friend's house. Basically, the next day we do the same thing in reverse. It is still 10.7 miles of distance, but our displacement is negative 2.1 miles the way that it was in part A. So we can see situations where the distance is the same for two different trips. We can see situations where the displacement is the same for two different trips. I want us to recognize that each situation we deal with, we just have to, for distance, count up all the legs of the journey, and for displacement, use the equation that we introduced in our slides. Now, we just talked about all those different trips, but we really never said how long they took. 10.7 miles, no matter how much I like my friend, I am not going to walk that far for them. So maybe I took the bike, uh, my bicycle. Maybe I took a bus that's going up and down our street all the time. Maybe I drove there. And in each of those cases, our answers to distance and displacement would be the same, but the speed that we're going would change. So this is where we really have to start to think about time. Time is a really interesting concept because it is extremely hard to define in words. Our book just says time is change. There's a newer textbook by Eric Mazur, who's well known for science education theory. And his book says, profound and mysterious, time is perhaps the greatest enigma in physics. We all know what is meant by time, but it is difficult, if not impossible, to explain the idea in words. Albert Einstein says, time is, is an illusion, uh, and Douglas Adams adds, lunchtime doubly so. When we pick up in our next video, we will start using time as a defined term but defined in a um, equation instead of in words. So we'll pick up from there in that next video.